Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast. Welcome into April. We are just 10 days out of the blue-white game in Beaver Stadium. Part of my voice there. Um, and we'll get a chance to see this Penn State squad in action with a lot of you in familiar territory. We were back in practice uh, action yesterday. Uh, got a longer look at these Nittany Lions in the evening. We came back to the facilities after practice. We heard from head coach James Franklin, special teams coordinator Justin Lustig, a few different players, and in fact, a few different transfer players, which we really appreciate. Typically, historically, at least with James Franklin and this regime, we haven't had access to transfer players until August at the preseason media day. So kind of accelerated that process, got us in front of guys like Julian Fleming, Nolan Rucci, Jalen Kimber yesterday, A.J. Harris, the Georgia uh, cornerback transfer, was initially on that list. Uh, he was scratched off at late. We expect to hear from him this spring as well. But we're going to dive into those conversations a little bit later here on the episode. Uh, we're going to talk to Tyler Calvaruso. Big commitment announcement coming tomorrow, Thursday, April 4th, from top in-state quarterback Matt Zollers. We'll break down that, what he's hearing, and the latest in Nittany Lions recruiting intel. They had a bunch of recruits on campus yesterday. Uh, but first, we begin with Daniel Gallen, who spent time with me and Mark Brennan and Grace Brennan out of practice. It was our fourth consecutive Tuesday out there on the field. We've got one more Tuesday of a of, of viewing window left ahead of us before we all get into Beaver Stadium, Daniel. But pretty quickly now, we're on the back end of this schedule for spring ball uh, got going uh, four weeks ago, and we've got one week ahead of us. I think they're going to pack in five or six practices between now and the blue-white game, which counts as a practice. So a lot more to be done, Daniel, but we're now at the point where there are some tangible conversations happening about team progress, individual development, and how this thing might end up looking when the team gets on the field against West Virginia in late August. Uh, Tuesday night was our our ninth look or their their ninth practice our our fourth look at this team and uh, you know you can I think at this point see different things with the offense you can see how the team is moving through drills you can get a sense for the mood and the feel and how even someone like Tom Allen uh, or Justin Lustig how their comfort is coming along through the process so yeah, I think that there's you know, it's a little tough when we're only there once a week and you know, there's not really quantifiable like numbers or anything that we can draw on uh, to you know, really quantify that progress. But I think on our weekly basis going in there, you can just kind of see and feel things coming along. And uh, I'm really excited to get that look at them in 10 days. Yeah. And, and as I said, we kind of got a surprise start with these transfer players and, and getting a chance to check in with them on their acclimation. Uh, we did hear from Julian Fleming back in early January, about 48 hours before he officially enrolled with Penn State. But these other guys that we got yesterday, Jalen Kimber, who made the move from the Florida Gators, he, he attended high school in Texas. He formerly was with the Georgia Bulldogs. A lot to catch up on with him. We did not hear from him before he got to campus in January. Same with Nolan Rucci. It happened really fast between him going in the portal at Wisconsin after their bowl game to him actually starting uh, classes here on campus. I think he told us yesterday it was seven days in between his final game in a Wisconsin uniform and when he was actually enrolled in classes here in Happy Valley. So very quick transition. But we, we'll begin with Julian Fleming, Daniel, because he's the guy who's really been the headliner of this transfer class. We spent a lot of time talking about him last week because James Franklin gave us a progress report, very glowing one at that, about Julian Fleming and some of his, his new teammates had spoken up a little bit about his leadership traits and just his ability to maybe rise that receiver unit. Now, Julian Fleming was hesitant to say that it's any kind of a one-man role to, to help that receiver room take the next step. He said it's going to be a collective effort. And he did, he did acknowledge what Andy Kotelnik, he told us a couple of weeks ago and saying he does sense there's a chip on the shoulder with this receiver group at large. He said he can't necessarily speak to a, a great extent on it because he wasn't part of this group for the last year. He didn't go through the highs and lows with them. But he says it certainly is palpable and something that you can pick up. And I thought it was really interesting that that the common theme of Julian Fleming's conversation on Tuesday night at the practice field, Daniel, was health. Now, he talked about injuries being the most frustrating factor of his career so far. He addressed a couple uh, a couple issues he had with his soldiers, sh shoulders, saying those are now cleaned up. And generally speaking, he just says this has been the healthiest offseason he's put together to this point since leaving high school as the number one wide receiver prospect in the nation. And it's kind of scary to hear him say that out loud because he's got another week and a half of, of spring practice and he's got to get out there and, and do his thing. But very confident right now is Julian Fleming in his health. 
Um, and also that he made the right move. He's he's had family coming to practices. It's an hour and 20 minute drive for him to get back home. He's got a younger sister. He's been able to spend more time with and grandparents and all that stuff. So sounds like a guy who, when you put it all together, is in a really good spot right now, but very clearly understands that he has a lot to prove. This wide receiver unit has a lot to prove. And there's nothing that he can say here in the first week of April that's going to make much of a difference in that process. But I thought it was very much what you'd expect from Julian Fleming coming off a long conversation we had with him in January. The humility that, that is very apparent after his time in Columbus and then dealing with some of that stuff. He's very open and honest about the way the injuries have been a blessing in disguise because of the way they forced him to mature, to grow up. And he was very open about Penn State being a place that he felt like he could come back to. And despite it not ending on the greatest note when he was a high school recruit, that that door being open the communication line being in a good place with James Franklin and ultimately other pieces of the, of the staff. And it's a guy who's got a one and done situation ahead of him here at Penn state and, and fully seems to grasp what is at stake right now for him. I thought that the the health piece was really interesting uh, from Fleming and his honesty in talking about it, because I do feel like over the, the past couple of years, whenever you would hear something about him coming out of Columbus, uh, it was usually that he wasn't on the field or couldn't be on the field. Um, and you saw that how those other wide receivers in the room, you know, they were talented in their own right, but they had openings uh, to get on the field and they took advantage of them. Um, so I think that if you do have a healthy Fleming, uh, especially because we know the style of play style of player that he is in terms of being big and physical, willing to block on the outside, uh, if if he's healthy, I think that's something that can be a really, really big boost uh, for Penn State moving forward. But I, it was interesting to hear him, you know, kind of uh, in a, you know, larger setting uh, than than when he he joined you earlier this year, kind of reflect on this process. Um, you know, the relationship with James Franklin uh, and the coaching staff. I, I think that you're seeing with him uh, and then similarly with with Nolan Rucci, who we also talked to, um, I think you're kind of learning uh, how Penn State handles some of these recruitments that don't go their way, uh, their approach to things and how there's definitely a, a bit of a, a long view that they're taking, uh, which I think is really interesting and is something that I think is paying off for them right now. So, um, yeah, I think that you know, Fleming is a, is a pretty important piece uh, for this offense. Um, you know, it really sounds like he's not going to be the one to say it himself. But when you talk to you know, other people, you know, we were on a Zoom with Drew Aller earlier Wednesday, uh, you just kind of get the sense that you know, he's, he's someone who can be really, really pivotal for this team this fall. Nolan Rucci told us when, um, when he kind of not, not talking about himself and his background, but getting to Julian Fleming a little bit. And he said that he is thriving in this offense this spring from what he has seen. And uh, Fleming says uh, he has really enjoyed life in Andy Kotelnicki's offense. He's enjoying getting to know Marcus Higgins in that receiver unit. Uh, but he said it's been a little weird uh, initially watching some practice films, seeing himself in a Penn State uniform. Uh, kind of strange. I think he's getting more used to that practice by practice. By the time he's out in Beaver Stadium, it, it'll be it'll be pretty normal for him. But he did say returning to Beaver Stadium, a place where he was on the receiving ends of, of uh, some not so friendly uh, chance in, in, in his uh, last couple of visits to town as a Buckeyes receiver. He said it's going to be pretty surreal getting, getting out there. He did call Beaver Stadium the best atmosphere in college football. This is a guy who out at Ohio State has had the opportunity to experience a lot of big game atmospheres across the country. And he circled back to this one as the, as, as the top, uh, the top spot to play ball. Um, and I just think with Fleming, <clears throat> Daniel, you, you think about uh, the fact that he wasn't able to be healthy at Ohio state, the fact that he was surrounded by first round talent in that receiver room. And yet he told us on Tuesday night that he was about 50, 50 at the point where he, at the end of the regular season with Ohio state, whether he was going to put his name into the transfer portal or put his name into the NFL draft and just take a shot. You know, we, we've, you don't necessarily need to be coming off the most accomplished season. A guy like Trey Potts, for instance, turned down extra eligibility to put his name in the hat, try to turn pro. Uh, Fleming ultimately decided he needed one more year at the college level to prove to himself what he can do and to prove the talent evaluators. And what we do know is that if he can put together his finest season thus far and, and going back at Ohio State, his junior year was the best, although he missed a few games during that season because of an injury. If he's able to produce, I mean, instantly the financial impact will be very different as he makes the move rather than being maybe non-drafted guy. Um, but also you, you just got to look at the fact that what it could mean for Penn State. If he finds it 
in, in this moment at the very end of his college career, and he finds it with a team that is so desperate for more weapons at receiver and, quite frankly, more accountability just on, on the offensive end from some of the skill positions, a guy that they, they needed to add to this team. It just it feels like the perfect fit. And until we hear otherwise, it just seems like this is about as ideal of a marriage as you could ask for through three months. Definitely. I, I think that this is something that can be mutually beneficial for both sides beyond just the 12, 13, 14, however many games they end up playing this fall. Um, I, I think that if Julian Fleming comes here and puts himself in a position where he's boosting that draft stock a little bit and he shows some things that he didn't necessarily get to show at, at Ohio State, um, that's going to help him uh, financially down the line. And then you look at Penn State, <clears throat> excuse me, that if they're able to, you know, have a wide receiver like Julian Fleming come in and produce, you know, that's something that you can use in the transfer portal. That's something that you can use on the recruiting trail. Um, and I think also that he's one of these guys that there's going to be kind of a, a long tail of his impact if things go really well with these younger guys that are in the room, you know, Josiah Brown, Peter Gonzalez, Tysier Denmark, um, you know, they're going to be true freshmen this fall working with someone like Julian Fleming. Um, even some of these third year players, you know, there's, there's five guys who are either juniors or redshirt sophomores. You know, they have the opportunity to really, really learn from someone like Julian Fleming. And that's something that they can you know, spin forward after Fleming leaves. So, you know, I think that this is something that uh, can really, really work out nicely you know, for both Fleming and for Penn State. Yeah, redshirt freshman Carmelo Taylor told us during winter workouts that that he was already gravitating towards Fleming, wanting to be kind of a, a guy following his lead. And, and that's you know before they even put on the pads and got on the practice field. Um, we have a full video at lines247.com of the entire Julian Fleming a Q and a from Tuesday night at the practice field. Check that out. We also have a full video of James Franklin's weekly Q and a over at lines 247.com. We dropped a bunch of notes from these things as well. Uh, while I was speaking with special teams coordinator, Justin Lustig on um, one portion of the field, you were over front and center with Jalen Kimber, who, as I mentioned earlier, made the move from the Florida Gators. He was a starter in that Gator secondary last year it was a rough season down in Gainesville, kind of hard to tr figure out what exactly was going on for that defense overall. But he started his career out in Georgia. He's a top 100 overall prospect who's now in year five at the college level, technically carries a sixth year because of that COVID eligibility. But, Daniel, we're talking about high-level Texas high school standout, going to the Georgia Bulldogs, going to the Florida Gators. And, and every time we hear about Jalen Kimber, you hear the phrase pro um, or 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 prepared, every you know, ready for this moment, came here for a reason. What did you learn when you got a chance to hear from Kimber himself? Yeah, I think Jalen Kimber was really interesting to talk to because yeah, I think that, you know, while he does have a pretty interesting pedigree in terms of time at Georgia, time at Florida, that was a very well-regarded recruit coming out. You know, a lot of that was kind of a, a long time ago at this point, whereas with A.J. Harris, it's a little bit more immediate where it was last year. He was a freshman five-star recruit. So I think that, you know, pairing those two together, you know, I'm, I'm probably guilty of this too. You gravitate a little bit more towards Harris. Um, in, in terms of what he can do both this year and beyond. But in talking to Jalen Kimber, uh, it really fits in with what Chuck Losey and James Franklin have been saying um, about these transfers when they come in, is that it's very businesslike for them. They're here, they're here for a reason. They know why they're here. And Jalen Kimber talked about that a little bit. I think that he wants to show that he can stay healthy. He wants to show that he can be a contributor on the defense. He knows the, the reputation that Penn State has of – you know, turning out really high level cornerback play. And he wants to put himself next in that uh, next in line. And he said that he had a, a previous relationship with Terry Smith, um, you know, dating back to when he was in high school. Um, it, he said that the first time he was in the portal, uh, there was some contact with Penn state. Um, but the second time in the portal, you know, he really wanted to be somewhere that had a winning culture um, somewhere that was competitive um, somewhere that you know, he really felt that he could thrive personally. Um, you know, he is, like you mentioned, he is, he does have an extra year of eligibility next year if he wants it. Um, I know that when he announced his commitment to Penn State out of the portal, he said that this was going to be his last year. Um, you know, he still acknowledged though that if he, if he has to come back for a sixth year, he has to come back. Um, you know, it felt kind of, you know, seemed, you could tell that he's someone who's been around for a while in terms of maturity. Um, and, and how he was looking at things. So, you know, I think that you know, Kimber is a, a 
you know, might be a little bit more under the radar, you know, because he's a little bit more re removed um, from some of those accolades that he might have had earlier in his career. Um, but I think that he could be could be pretty interesting and he had a little bit of a, a sense of humor, too, which, which I appreciated. Uh, someone asked about, you know, the difference between Florida and Penn State. Uh, and, you know, he thought for a second and then he just goes the weather, um, you know, because we are, are dealing with a a miserable week right now. Um, but he did offer up that his family's from Chicago, uh, even though he played high school uh, football in Texas. So this isn't too, too strange for him. Yeah, he's involved in a competition where they, they need to replace multiple starters and really three starters when you factor in Daquan Hardy into that conversation. And then over at tackle, you need two, two, two new starters there. You need to fortify your depth plans. And Nolan Rucci, uh, certainly a part of that conversation very quickly and getting to campus uh, back in January now has a few weeks of spring practices under his belt. Uh, initially, the focus for him was right tackle. He's told us the last couple weeks there's been more of a cross training back at left tackle and right tackle. Uh, of course, his game experience at Wisconsin, as we've talked on the podcast, came exclusively at left tackle. He had about seven regular sn season snaps there last year. Then their starter goes down <clears throat> in the bowl game against LSU, the ReliQuest Bowl, and all of a sudden he's playing 35 snaps at left tackle. And, and he talked a bit about that on Tuesday night what it did for his confidence, uh, reminding him that he can get out there at this level and compete and succeed. And we know it was a significant thing for Penn State because James Franklin talked about it uh, back in February that their ability to watch film of Nolan Rucci against an LSU in that kind of a setting, it was a confidence booster on both ends of the equation. So obviously a lot of history with Penn State. He was a five-star prospect in the state of Pennsylvania. We've kind of gone over that with Julian Fleming in the past. And kind of similar, Daniel, was the fact that how he described you know, resurfacing as a Penn State target for the second time years later um, and, and why it made sense for him. Julian Fleming said so much that it, 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 those relationships were there. You just had to kind of remind yourself and, and, and build them back up. Sounds like the same kind of deal with Nolan Rucci. He told us that it came down to Penn State and Wisconsin. Uh, ultimately, a few things tipped the scales in the Badgers' favor. Certainly his older brother playing there in Madison didn't hurt. Um, he said he enjoyed his three years at Wisconsin, but it was time to see what greener pastures might await him, and he felt like he might have a better opportunity to get on the field. Uh, and so it's interesting because he gets here. And the first thing Franklin really talks about him is he's a skinny. He's a skinny offensive tackle. He's 299. He got here, you know, 299, 300 pounds. Rucci says he's now 315. He wants to play at 320 this year. So I'm not sure exactly what was going on in Wisconsin versus Penn State. I, I know that, that James Franklin a couple times have taken an opportunity to say that uh, that, that Rucci's been, you know, impressed by their, their player development end of, of things here at Penn State. And he, he spoke very highly of the nutritional aspect, but – this is somebody who, unlike Fleming, has multiple years of eligibility. He's got this year. He's got next year. But Penn State has immediate needs at tackle. Drew Shelton is sidelined this year. He's the most experienced guy by far at that position. Donka remains uh, in play there at right tackle. You've got Javen Williams, Chimdi Ono, who are younger components, second-year players, former blue-chip players. Um, so Rucci's a pretty fascinating figure here because I think by all accounts and even his own, he's got some catching up to do. He doesn't have a lot of, of track record in games at, at the Big Ten level, although he's spent a lot of time on, on a Big Ten campus. And so you kind of get a situation where it doesn't need to all come together this year for him to, to validate this move. But Penn State and Rucci, it feels like that, that if he's at least a two deep guy who they can rely on, spot starter, maybe even a true starter, then you build off of that and see where you are in 2025. But this is a fun one because he was pretty open and honest about you know, what it's meant to get back here, to have his parents show up to practice, what this school means to his parents. His dad, of course, was a second round draft pick out of Penn State, played on the offensive line, New England Patriots, all decades team for the 1990s. And his mother was an athlete here with the Nittany Lions. So it's one of those things where I know a lot of Penn State fans are scratching their head and saying, well, why wasn't he here to start? And then, and, and, you know, why is it happening now with like Fleming? But you get what you get, and I think that Penn State uh, finds a really uh, – again, I'll use the, I'll use it just a fascinating figure here because of his background, because of kind of the, the empty cupboard when it comes to his college career and what you can point to as evidence of what he can do, and then just seeing him in front of you and realizing what that size brings to Penn State's tackle position and then rolling it forward into preseason camp, wondering exactly what these competitions will look like. As James Franklin told us Tuesday night – he expects heated battles at both tackle spots. 
The one thing about Rucci that I was really interested in going back and listening to him talk and reading his quotes is, you know, the way that he talks about Phil Troutwine. It seems like that Troutwine is someone who you know, has really impressed Rucci, I think, in terms of you know, wanting to be developed uh, you know, by a coach like that. And you kind of think back to you know, when Rucci was being recruited, um, you know, the Penn State offensive line was in a, a very different spot. And that was very early, uh, I believe, in, in Phil Troutwine's tenure. Um, and so I, I think that you're kind of seeing, um, you know, the development of the Penn State offensive line and also, you know, the work that Troutwine has been able to do both in terms of development and on the recruiting trail. I think this is another way that you kind of see that pay off uh, for Penn State. Um, you know, I think that it might it, it took a little bit of patience uh, with with Troutwine and this offensive line. Um, you know, we know that, you know, 2021 uh, it took a little bit for to get through that year with that group. Um, but these past two years have been really impressive. And, you know, it's clear that someone like Rucci noticed that, that he noticed the job that Phil Troutwine was doing. And when he when he was in the portal, it was kind of like, you know, that's someone I can see myself getting developed by that someone I want to play for. Um, so I thought that was something that really stood out to me uh, going back through and you know listening to Rucci and, and reading what he had to say. And he's yet another guy who it will all become more real for him when they're in Beaver Stadium and 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 you've got family and friends there for games. But he said having mom and dad come to practice, getting to to have a pretty easy drive to your grandparents uh, and, and uh, for Easter last weekend, all those things weren't in play when you're playing football in Madison, Wisconsin. I think you said it was a 14 hour ride for his parents uh, at that point. So you know, different perspective for these guys in Fleming and Rucci, and of course, uh, Kimber has his own background. We hope to learn more about AJ Harris in the next week and a half or so when Penn State makes him available, because because he's coming from a position of of three years of eligibility in front of him here with the Nittany Lions and a five-star background in his own right. Shifting over to James Franklin's commentary after practice on Tuesday, um, didn't get a ton in terms of where positional competitions stand. You don't really expect to hear that much during the eight March and April, and, and I think that's more of a summer conversation. But something that flashed to me and someone who has flashed to James Franklin was Keandre Lambert-Smith. Um, the comments here from, from Franklin were that he is not just really flashing, uh, but doing it with greater consistency. Um, and, and James Franklin says they need him to be a, a, a productive receiver. He needs it for himself. This is such a, this is such kind of a, a puzzle, uh, putting the pieces together and, and how this works. And just based on how it ended for Keandre Lambert Smith, the last four games last year, including the bowl, you know, under 30 total receiving yards in those four games. This was the number one target in your passing game for the first eight or nine games of the season. And to kind of make this more of a mysterious circumstance, as we said on the podcast, Keandre Lambert Smith has not been available for media interaction, media interview since I believe early November of 2023. So a lot has happened for him. A lot has happened for this team. They fired their offensive coordinator. They hired a new one. Uh, they've added Julian Fleming. They've had uh, a, a lot of progression on the field, and we haven't heard from Keandre Lambert Smith himself, but we know James Franklin doesn't just say things to say them and put it out there. So what did you make of his comments that were certainly leaning positive on Keandre Lambert Smith? And, and we also heard from Drew Aller on Keandre Lambert Smith today, a guy who's in year five, carried a ton of confidence with him when he got to campus, and we just don't quite know what kind of crossroads he may be facing in his career right now. Yeah, I, I think Aller kind of you know did a nice job of sort of you know reminding us you know, that physically and athletically the the type of player that Keandre Lambert Smith is. I think Aller said that Lambert Smith has made some spectacular plays and also brought up that he's been good at, at making defenders miss in space. And um, I think Aller mentioned the angle tackling drills uh, when you know Lambert Smith just has that speed where he can make things difficult. Um, for opposing defenders to bring him down. Um, you know, but overall, I mean, it is kind of a, a broken record a little bit with Lambert Smith at this point. It feels like the consistency part of it has always been uh, the, the big thing that's you know hung over him um, during his career. Uh, I think earlier early in his career, um, it was definitely framed as the mental development, um, you know, developing so that, if you have a bad play, it doesn't carry over to the to the next play, um, you know, that sort of thing. And then now as as he's gotten older, I, I think it's just kind of become a more general um, consistency thing for him, which you know, we've been hearing about it for a long time. And I think that getting that feedback both from Franklin and from Aller, I think that that 
is just one of those things that you kind of file away as a positive moving forward. But when it really comes down to it, <laughs> are we going to see it this fall? Yeah, and, and so Keandre Lambert Smith is a guy that, that we heard from Aller and Franklin specifically saying some of the big plays that he's been producing as well. Some some of those momentum swinging type plays. Um, another player that that seems to be you know really taking it uh, to others on the field right now. Tony Rojas, six foot two, two hundred twenty five pound sophomore linebacker, projected to take a big step even before Abdul Carter moved to defensive end. That move really put a spotlight on Rojas and, and James Franklin did as well on Tuesday night when he talked about him and Kobe King really playing well off of each other in those two primary linebacker spots. Um, Kobe King, of course, a returning starter at the Mike position. When you look at, at, at Rojas, though, Franklin says he could play either of those. They think he's intelligent enough to handle that Mike role. He can be vocal enough to handle that role. And he's also physical enough and has the instincts to play the boundary backer position. We know he can run. Uh, we know he's put on a lot of weight. And we know that last year in relatively small sample sizes, he packed the production into like he'd get 10 snaps and he might get three tackles and a turn and a forced turn turnover. I mean, that was the kind of the kind of uh, the small doses that we got of Tony Rojas extending all the way through the peach bowl. And James Franklin said, quote, we expect it to skyrocket this year in terms of his impact and his production. And, and no surprise. It's almost an afterthought at this point. We haven't been harping on Tony Rojas as a breakout pick because I think it's understood that he is maybe the breakout candidate on defense. There's some other names we could get to. Uh, but a lot to like about what we heard about Tony Rojas. And, and additionally, um, you know, beyond those transfer cornerbacks and beyond the offensive tackle spots where James Franklin talked about competition, um, we did hear about Nick Dawkins as well, and talking about roster returners after all the, the, the transfer conversation earlier this episode. Um, Dawkins is a guy that, that Franklin sounds very confident in, Daniel, leading this offensive line at the center position. As a leader, of course, we've heard about that. But we keep hearing time and time again from teammates, from a couple of different coaches now, including Franklin, that it's really been a, a seamless transition from Hunter Norzad to Nick Dawkins. And, and it's hard to really talk too much about it before they line up against another defensive line and, and get thrown a bunch their way. And you have to react in real time and, and, and command the huddle and I'm sorry, command your offensive line in the heat of battle. But really like the early reports on Nick Dawkins and and. and Franklin added to that with some of his comments saying he's smart, he's charismatic, and he isn't afraid to lead by actions and verbally, which you don't see much anymore with young men that are willing to speak up and challenge their teammates. And that's something that, that Dawkins has been able to do because uh, he holds himself to that standard himself. Um, it just feels like they've got a really good thing going here. Uh, I know people are excited about Cooper Cousins, who may be the next man up at center. He's a true freshman. But Nick Dawkins looks like a really legitimate solution to what would be a quandary for a lot of programs, losing a second team all conference center. Yeah, I think that this is you know, kind of a, another thing with Nick Dawkins where patience really pays off um, in terms of especially at a position like the offensive line where you know there's so much development that some players have to do from the physical side. We know at some of those positions that there's a lot on your plate mentally, uh, especially at center. Um, and I think that, you know, Nick Dawkins being healthy, being able to get these reps, being able to get through last year and get some real in-game experience. I, I think that, that that's really, you know, served him well. And we've heard so much about him as a personality uh, and his presence, uh, which is you know, obviously very true and well-deserved. But I think it's cool to finally be really hearing about him as a player a lot now and, and someone who can really be a linchpin in the center of that offensive line. Uh, we know that he won't have any trouble communicating uh, with his teammates, but um, you know, I just think that him putting himself in this position, uh, you know, it, it's really cool for him. Um, and I think that you know that there's been a lot of rehab, a lot of work uh, to kind of get to this point and be ready to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, and I think for Penn State to be able to put a, a fifth year, fifth year senior uh, at a really important position when it in terms of communication, I think that's really big for them. Dawkins uh, approached 200 total snaps last year as the primary backup to Hunter Norzad. He got involved a little bit at guard as well uh, at some different spots during the season. Um, just a quick review of what we heard from Justin Lustig, who's in his first year as special teams coordinator after spending the last few seasons down at Vanderbilt, a guy that James Franklin had on his radar for a while, made the move when Stacy Collins left for Boise State. Um, just addressing the kicker competition, it sounds like Chase Meyer, who made the move from Tulsa as a transfer and, and, and was their primary kicker last year, had success 
success. It's not like he's playing catch up right now um, as the new guy in town, Sanders Sahadak, who's now a redshirt junior all of a sudden, a guy who's been on scholarship now for, uh, for several years. And then Ryan Barker, who came to town last year as a walk on, turned some heads and has done some nice things here in spring ball. That competition still early. I mean, we got a long way. I doubt we're going to get an answer there until late August. But just a bit of a heads up there. Meyer, again, was the guy that, that they brought in from Tulsa. Uh, so we'll see if he can catch up and make this more of a three-man competition. James Franklin kind of described it as a three-man competition. Then following up with Lustig, sounded more like you know three guys are competing, but two guys have kind of separated themselves from the other to this point. Caden Saunders is the current leader at punt returner. Wondered if that would be the case because he was the primary punt returner last year until midseason. Daquan Hardy steps up, gets an opportunity in his first chance. He takes two back to the house against UMass. Then he takes it and runs with it, ends up being a second team all-conference specialist. Um, so Caden Saunders, you know, the confidence is there from Lustig right now. He said a big thing about Saunders. At, while they would love to see that dynamic ability from him, like they got out of Daquan Hardy, he said a key thing is they can really account for him catching the football on, on difficult situations, not letting it hit the turf and then roll 15 yards. And he says Caden Saunders' ability to save them yardage on some of those more tough you know, tougher punts to field is a really key asset that goes overlooked by a lot of fans. So good good to hear Saun, uh, Saunders is back on the upswing at that uh, position. And then he talked about mixing up uh, things in drill work, having guys on offense become the tacklers, having guys – on defense become ball carriers. He said it provides the staff and himself a better way to see oh, who maybe can flash with that football in some special teams work and who maybe can be a contributor in coverage that otherwise you might not have known. He pointed to Liam Clifford and uh, and running back Cam Wallace as two guys on offense who have really shown a lot to him as, as coverage assets. And he pointed to King Mack as someone who, when the ball is in their hands, can do some really special things. We've heard a lot about that with King Mac. He was an absolute terror in high school at St. Thomas Aquinas in South Florida on special teams, blocking kicks, returning kicks. Uh, so keep an eye on King Mac on special teams. And I'll just note, very grateful to have Don DeLuca. It is Justin Lustig. is the guy who's returning as a special teams captain. He's competing to be a starting linebacker for you. Uh, but he talked about Don DeLuca being really an extension of this coaching staff. Don DeLuca is someone that we heard from on Wednesday morning. We'll have notes up at lines247.com. He had a lot to say about himself, and he's a fun story. Came in as a walk-on, has emerged as a key leader and, and a key player for Penn State, but he's really good at talking about other guys too. So check out those notes at lines247.com. Just to finish off this portion, and, and, and before we get over to some recruiting talk with Tyler Calvaruso, Daniel, we also heard from Drew Aller, as we've referenced a few times, and Zachy Wheatley, who's been one of the hot topic kind of players this offseason because he's gotten a few different shout outs from James Franklin about playing the best ball and you know competing the best thus far by far in his career as a fourth year safety. So anything really stood out to you you wanted to share with the audience from Zaki, from Drew and, and a reminder, all of this content video, notes, quotes, context, lines247.com, and you have access to that seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You don't have to wait for us to, to, to describe it on the podcast. So check out that coverage too. I think with Wheatley, the the one thing that came up that is going to be interesting with him is, um, you know, how does he make this, make his performance now carry over into the fall? Um, you know, we, he was pretty quiet last year. Um, you know, I think two years ago, we, he had all that off season buzz and, um, you know, came up with a couple big plays. I think at, at Auburn, um, you, you saw that ability to cause turnovers really pop up. Um, but, you know, he was really quiet last year. And, you know, we've talked about it in terms of KJ Winston and Jalen Reed really asserting themselves atop that depth chart. Um, I think in terms of Tom Allen coming in and maybe shifting personnel packages around a little bit, using more three safety sets with Jalen Reed's ability to play that nickel spot called the lion. I think Wheatley could be one of the biggest beneficiaries of there um, because if you move Reed up closer to the offensive line, you can have Wheatley back there playing center field where you know, we, we know that he has some of that ability to make things happen, to track balls, to get his hands on it. So uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see how he really spins this forward um, and, and what kind of role uh, Tom Allen has for him and on the back end. Um, as for Drew Aller, I mean, you know, it's it was just really, I think, an illuminating and insightful conversation from him. Um, you know, I thought you know, he's always been a, a really thoughtful interview uh, during his time at Penn State and before, but you know, I thought that this time we we kind of got some real insight into how things are going for this offense. 
Um, you know, we asked him about some of the things we were hearing from the defense about how they're being really stressed uh, in terms of their eyes and communication. And you know, Drew Aller said that he can really see it, uh, that these pre-shift mo- pre-snap motions, um, you know, the ability to, to change formations, um, to kind of get themselves into the coverage that they want as an offense um, it has been that has been really effective for them. And they think that that's something that'll carry over into the fall. And Drew Aller said that they're helping the defense along the way, that this Penn State defense is going to see things that are similar to what the offense is doing right now, and uh, they'll be prepared for it. Um, you know, Aller also talked about uh, at this point in, the, in spring that they've really kind of locked in on being able to run the same plays out of different formations and, and different packages. Um, and, and I think that that's something that when Penn State hired Andy Kotelnicki that we heard a little bit um, is that you know he's able to make things look really different. Uh, you know, he's able to mix up personnel, keep the concepts the same, and and really you know create opportunities um, for players to make plays. So yeah, I I have all the the quotes from Drew Aller uh, up on Lions twenty four seven right now. Uh, you know, going back through it, um, you know, he really sounds like someone who is in control, really confident. Um, you know, going into year two as a starter. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot less surprises involved with just his day to day life now as as a guy who's a returning starter. And it was something I thought he definitely I agreed with James Franklin in saying he looks leaner this this spring. Just seeing him operate out there and, and drill work, he says he's 240 to 243 right now. He's cut down some some fat. Uh, he plans to, to cut a little bit more between now and and August. I I don't know necessarily what that looks like for 60 minutes on the field come matchups. But uh, I think it's, it's, it's obviously encouraging anytime you see a guy making strides um, physically, mentally, otherwise, and Drew Aller seems to be doing all of that. We have a full video of Drew Aller's complete Q and a from Wednesday morning over at lines, 24, com. Check that out. Daniel, appreciate the coverage. Uh, we'll be doing a lot more of it together. We've got Nick Singleton on a zoom call on Thursday, and then we've got another practice to look at next week. And then we got the blue white game to get into. So uh, plenty of coverage coming your way from the spring practices next week we'll take a a longer look at what we're looking ahead to with the blue white game who we're most excited to see some storylines involved there but for now we'll get back to work over at the site we'll shift gears to recruiting thank you daniel spring is fine bye i'll talk to you later tyler see ya uh, we talked about this spring practice schedule also being a really pivotal point for Penn State's recruiting efforts, and it has been to this stage. Tyler Calvaruso is going to bring us the latest right here on the Lions 24-7 podcast. Tyler, good to have you back on. Good to be back on, man. We've got a lot to uh, got a lot to dive into. We're coming up on a pretty key spot here for Penn State on the recruiting trail, so uh, I'm glad I was able to get back on here with you today. Yeah, we had you on last Friday, uh, breaking down uh, an important visit weekend, but also looking ahead to some of those official visits. Mm-hmm. We're going to turn the page in a, uh, in a couple of weeks here, getting out of spring ball, looking toward official visits, looking toward prospect camps. But before we get into all that, quarterback Matt Zollers is ready to make his decision. It's coming on Thursday afternoon, the top quarterback in the state of Pennsylvania, top 10 player at the position nationally, and a guy who has really just jumped big, not just in terms of uh, in terms of recruiting rankings at places like 24-7 sports, but in the eyes of Power 5 coaching staffs. We know Penn State's wanted him for a while. He's been focused on some finalists. He's been traveling to get a better feel for each of them. What's the latest here? What do our listeners need to know as we're – coming up on 24 hours uh, before Zollers actually pulls the trigger and lets the world know where he's heading. Yep, right here at 1.30. We're about an hour and a half and away from the uh, from the 24-hour mark for Matt Zollers. And, you know, it's the timeline that's held true. You know, he's taken all of his spring visits. That's done. He's sitting down with his family. They're in decision mode. And there's going to be an announcement coming tomorrow afternoon. You know, it's been a, uh, it's been a busy morning on the uh, – Intel front, you know, in terms of asking around and trying to get a better feel for this one, because the fact of the matter is Zollers and his camp, they play this one really close to the vest. You know, there hasn't been a lot coming out of that, but the sense that I get right now here on Wednesday afternoon is, you know, there's a lot of chatter surrounding the SEC programs in the mix here, and those two being Georgia and Missouri. Missouri kind of jumped in here later than most schools as somewhat of a wild card. I believe that's what I labeled them in an article towards the end of the winter. And they've definitely graduated from wild card status to legitimate player to land Matt Zollers. Between the affinity for the scheme, he likes the offensive coordinator Missouri has in place in Kirby Boone. 
you know, that staff down there has done a really good job recruiting him. And then at Georgia, I mean, Kirby Smart and Mike Bobo have done a lot of good things recruiting him. And, you know, those two are guys Zollers knows are probably going to be around for the duration of his collegiate career. You know, there's a ton of stability at Georgia. That's something that appeals to him. And one thing from the Penn State perspective, obviously, you know, one thing that we continue to hear is that every time that he's visited Penn State and he sees, you know, Andy Kotelnicki has his focus on the offense and, you know, the scheme and the play calling. And Danny O'Brien is so zoned in on quarterback development. That's a big deal for him because it goes without saying. Zollers wants to be developed and he wants to get to the next level and he wants to play professionally. And, you know, Penn State has laid out a pretty clear development plan for him. And make no doubt about it either. You know, Penn State has made it crystal clear to Zollers that they want to coach him. They want to be the one who gets him to that next level. So, you know, we're here. I, you know, by tonight, maybe there's a decision. I think as the day goes on, these schools are going to continue to kind of take their last crack, you know, Penn State included, take their last crack, get with Zoller, see what they could do to kind of, you know, make a last second move and, you know, figure out how to get this one done. But I'm thinking right now, based on the intel and the asking around this morning, my focus, my gut feeling more so is on those two SEC programs I mentioned in Georgia and Missouri. You know, he did visit Alabama before he squeezed a trip to Tuscaloosa in between all this. Maybe if he was announcing a little bit later, the Crimson Tide would have been more of a player. But I think when it comes to the SEC programs to watch, it's Georgia and Missouri. It's very interesting when you talk about a quarterback of this caliber, number six at the position, number 62 overall in 24-7 sports rankings. There's not a single crystal ball pick right now over on the site. There, There's not people out there proclaiming where he's going to go across our industry. And normally that's the case. Uh, and so – a little bit of a uh, little bit of mystery as we get you know 24 kind hours out more. It's right. like old it's, school. It, it is old school. It it does feel old school with that. And and let me ask you this, um, just to clear it up because I know people will probably bring it up, especially if he doesn't pick Penn State. Hmm. The presence of Beckham Kritza in this recruiting class as a quarterback down at Miami Central. He's been committed since last November. It means what for Matt Zollers? You know, you've got to know Zollers throughout this entire process. And he's one of those kids who, you know, he's a competitor. And I think he knows that no matter where he goes, he's going to have to compete, whether it be with another quarterback in his class or with the guys who are already in the room at the time he arrives on campus. So I think you could look at Beckham Kritz's presence and, you know, wonder what his role plays in this entire equation, especially considering the fact that Georgia's, uh, Georgia doesn't have a quarterback on board. But yeah, keep in mind, too, they've continued to recruit Juju Lewis. So, you know, and that's probably not something that's going to stop either. And then Missouri doesn't have a quarterback on board either. So, you know, it depends who you talk to. I, I don't think, you know, it's as big of a deal as maybe it would be with another prospect as we've seen in previous cycles. But, you know, I mean, it's definitely different than the other schools who are heavily involved with Zolly. You're talking about Penn State being the only program involved at this juncture that has a quarterback on board. So it's definitely noteworthy. Yeah, and, and do you get the sense that this decision is going to have a pretty final feel to it unless there's a coaching change down the road and, and a coach leaves after the season or something like that, where the decision that comes through, that school will be the one school that gets an official visit and that's the school that he's going to be recruiting for? Or do you get a sense that this may not be the punctuation mark at the recruiting process here in early April? I get a sense of finality. I think once he comes to this decision on Thursday, it's probably going to be it for him. Because you got to keep in mind, you know, how firm Zollers and his camp have been to this timeline of getting it done early so it could be part of a class, get to peer recruiting, get to a campus, the school of his choice for an official visit in June instead of going through June official visit season, still trying to figure out what he's doing. So that kind of approach leads me to believe once this one's done, it's probably going to be done. Is that going to keep – the other schools that missed out from contacting him? No. You know, it's up to him whether or not he wants to respond at the end of the day. I, I think, though, barring a change, you know, a significant change in his recruitment, like you mentioned, with a potential coaching change, I think once this one's done, it's probably going to be done. The one thing I'm very interested in moving forward from the Penn State side is what's going to happen if Zollers does decide to go elsewhere. Because you mentioned, you know, Chris is already on board. Malik Washington is a top 24-7 passer who is still available on the open market. He has an open official, open official visit date weekend on his schedule. Does Penn State, you know, ramp things up there and really make a move? That's going to be a pretty fascinating storyline to follow for me. So 
you know, this commitment, not only finality, but it has a domino effect on Penn State's approach for the remainder of the cycle as well. You know, I just mentioned Malik Washington, but there is very much a possibility that, you know, Penn State just decides, hey, look, we'll go with Beckham Kritza and we'll see what, what happens from that point on. But, uh, yeah, so it's uh, – there's a lot of layers and, like I said, kind of a domino effect with this ultimate decision. Uh, we'll, how about this? We'll check back in with you for second episode this week. By yeah. then, we'll have the announcement, and then we can kind of pick up the pieces, whatever that announcement is, and work off of that and have a conversation there. Does sound good? That sounds great to me. Okay. Um, Trent Wilson is a guy that we were going to talk about anyways because he's focused on four programs, defensive lineman out of Maryland. But we really got to talk about him now because you got you got you texted me as we were just getting set up for the pod. April 10th now. He's on the schedule for his own commitment announcement. That's one week from today. This is a guy that Penn State has had its swings with. They've had a chance to, to showcase their program. Who else is involved here, and, and what are you feeling a week out from this decision? You know, the timing of it is pretty interesting to me because Wilson was locked in to visit for the blue-white game on the 13th, and now he's planning on popping before even making it back to State College for that visit. Oklahoma has been the mover with Trent Wilson recently. There's a lot of buzz surrounding the suit owners and Wilson has also been pretty effusive in his praise of Ohio State and the Buckeyes and the defensive line coach Larry Johnson, who Penn State fans are plenty familiar with. And it's just, you know, his ability to develop guys and get them to the next level. So the Buckeyes are drawing plenty of praise from the Maryland standout. But you know, Penn State's been in this with Wilson for a really long time. He has a good relationship with Deion Barnes. That relationship has been developing going back to when Barnes was still a graduate assistant under John Scott Jr. So those two have known each other for a little while. Again, the timing of it and the recent buzz of Oklahoma kind of leads me to believe that the Sooners are trending to get this one done on the 10th. But, you know, we're going to have to wait and see what intel comes up in the coming days. But right now, I'd probably say keep a closest eye on Oklahoma. Good stuff there. We will uh, keep an eye on Trent Wilson, and we know if there's anything to update, you'll do that at lines247.com. Let's get into some recent visitors to Happy Valley, uh, one of which is an elite wide receiver prospect out of Bergen Catholic in New Jersey, top 10 talent at the position in Quincy Porter. He's a guy that we were looking ahead toward. Now that we're looking back, what did we learn? You know, I think it was a good visit. It was definitely a, a plus for Penn State to get Porter back to campus for this visit. It was something the staff – has been trying to do for really a long time now. You know, we touched on it last week prior to over the weekend. His pre his most recent previous visit to Penn State was a junior day during the winter of 2023. So it was a little bit between his you know, most recent visit to Penn State and when he had been back prior to that. So it was good for the staff to get him back in town. I think progress was made, but I think ground still needs to be made up. You know, this is a busy week for Porter on the visit. Phone. He's got multi-day trips to Ohio State and Michigan locked in. Those are two of the schools kind of setting the tone with him right now. So Porter's going to remain a name high on that wide receiver board. You know, Penn State would like to lock down an official visit with him. That's ultimately the goal. Will that happen? I can't say I'm quite sure one way or the other right now. So this is going to be one we continue to monitor moving forward. But again, encouraging to get him back, but still work to do. Um, down in Hillsborough County, Florida, at Sumner High School, Zaire Addison has been on Penn State's radar for a while. He made the long-distance trip to campus. He's had a few of them planned here in 2024, as we addressed last week on the podcast. Penn State, four-star offensive tackle, uh, top 150 overall prospect. How good of a position have they established to this point? Yeah, this is the big one on multiple fronts. Penn State absolutely loves this kid. I mean, he's just he, – they think he's going to be a big-time player at the next level, a guy who could play legitimately one through five on the offensive line given his athleticism, his measurables, and just his entire skill set of what he brings to the field. So there's a lot of excitement about Zaire Addison as a prospect. And from my conversation with Addison and, you know, those familiar with his recruitment over the weekend, I mean, this visit went probably about as well as it could have gone. For Penn State, so many things went right for the Nittany Lions. The relationship with Phil Trower remains in a really, really good place. Addison loves James Franklin, and so does his family. He had so much praise for James Franklin, just his overall demeanor, how he is on the practice field, how he just runs things, the attention to detail that he has. That's something that appeals to Addison. Also, circling back to Trower, and Addison really loves the way that Phil Trower goes about coaching up his players. And he gained some really, really valuable insight into what it's like to be part of Penn State's offensive line room. Olu Fashanu was in town. He spent a lot of time talking to him. And Fashanu, I mean, he made it pretty clear, you know, looking at Addison, he could be following in his footsteps three, four years from now. I think that was something that really resonated with Addison as well. For a guy like Olu Fashanu to look at him and say, look, you go to Penn State and you develop under this staff, you could be maybe where I am in the future. So, 
Now, I don't necessarily know if we've reached the point where Addison has a true leader in his recruitment, but I think if there is one, it might be Penn State. The staff has done a lot of good work with Addison. They're going to get him back for an official visit during the weekend of June 14th. That is going to be a huge opportunity in my eyes for Franklin Trout winning company to seal the deal here because the Nittany Lions have built up some pretty positive momentum. You had tight end Andrew Olesh running into, was it Brenton Strange yes. and Pat Fryermuth yeah, on yeah. campus a couple weeks ago. Now you've got Olu Fashionu, uh, you know, catching up with with, uh, with one of your top recruits. That's not a bad thing uh, to have going on on campus right now. And not far off from, from, from uh, where you'll find that offensive lineman in Tampa at the Wharton High School. Grayston Littleton is one of the premier cornerbacks in the state of Florida. He's the number 24 player at that position, a top 24-7 prospect. And he was one of the many recruits that we saw on campus Tuesday. Uh, we're not permitted to speak with these guys or, or take photos of them when they're at practice and we're at practice. But I texted you. I was like, this is about as many recruits that we've seen on a Tuesday, you know, filling the sidelines to this point this spring. He was among them. He was certainly a headliner considering his his clout in the ranking in the recruiting world. He's got 30 plus offers. He's in the 2025 class. Where is he on, on, on kind of the Penn State class radar as they try to build out this 2025 group? Yeah, I'd say he was most definitely the headliner of yesterday's group, which featured a lot of uh, a lot of regional guys made the trip to practice. That's why you're seeing so many of them. It was a pretty healthy group there for Penn State yesterday, but Littleton was definitely the biggest name in town. You know, Terry Smith goes about building that cornerback board, and you look at the re recruiting success he has had in Florida in recent cycles, and you know, I think that there's definitely a possibility that, that continues with Littleton as, you know, just his recruitment continues to roll on. He schedules these official visits. I remember catching up with Littleton a little bit earlier in the spring. He wasn't sure if he was going to be able to fit Penn State into his spring visit schedule because he's running track for the first time this spring. So, you know, he was trying to kind of piece that together, figure out when he get to town. He told me his first trip to Penn State, you know, if he wasn't going to be able to get down there for yesterday's visit, it might just be the official visit during the summer. But he squeezed in. He actually, up until recently, he didn't leave town until a little while ago because he stuck around to talk to the staff some more on Wednesday morning. And the feedback has been really positive. He's a big fan of Smith's coaching philosophy. Really, he got the chance to drive around town tour state college, see what it's all about, get a good look at campus. And it was a positive visit all around. Now, moving forward, you know, his recruitment has really heated up to the point where his offer list, he kind of has, it's like a pick em situation. You know, he's uh, and he's in that top 24 seven now. So his blow up has been well documented, but Penn state was in earlier than most of the power conference programs who offer Littleton. I think that's kind of notable here too, because that was something that he really appreciated at the time that Terry Smith was willing to take that chance on him earlier than a lot of other of the programs that have jumped in. So Penn State's going to be on his mind moving forward, especially coming out of this visit. And then the Lions accomplished some good things with the Florida standout. Another development that popped up Tuesday from those visits was a new offer in the 2026 class. I know you caught up with this young man, Connor Salmon uh, out of Virginia, a big bodied 6'1", 190 pound wide receiver as a sophomore, uh, North Carolina, Virginia, Duke, West Virginia, already involved here. Penn State hosts him, sends him home with an offer. What do you think the motivation was there, and what was the feedback from Salmon? Kind of, you know, just get the foot in the door, continue to build that relationship. Salmon was really enjoying his time on campus, just the message that James Franklin had to deliver to him when he offered. And, you know, he got the chance. This wasn't his first visit to Penn State. He actually got his first look at the Nittany Lions at the end of November when they hosted Rutgers. But obviously this was a much different experience for him, you know, getting more of a look at campus, getting a closer look on how Hagen's works with those wideouts on the practice field. And he's going to get the chance to receive some hands-on coaching from Hagen's during the summer. Those two talk about Salmon getting back to campus to camp for Penn State. And that that's going to prove to be of, of some value for both sides because, you know, they're going to get to see how Salmon reacts to Hagen's coaching, how he improves throughout the day, how he takes that coaching. And Salmon is getting is excited to get a closer look at how exactly Hagen's goes about coaching his guys. He saw that, you know, from a little bit from the outside on Tuesday. Now he's going to be in that setting where he is a wideout that Hagen's is coaching. So he's looking forward to that camp experience during the summer. Probably a good offer from Penn State to get in early. You know, this film is solid and Penn State likes the prospect. Let's finish our football recruiting conversation with a 2025 recruit and a big time name and a big time player, Bo Jackson at the running back spot uh, out of Cleveland, Ohio. He's the number three running back nationally. He's number 77 overall in the top 24 seven for the 2025 cycle. He has 
quite a collection of scholarship offers. He's a guy that Penn State offered pretty early in the process as an underclassman. We saw him on campus for prospect camp. He's made a cut to his recruitment. Penn State's still involved. But what do we make of their staying power, perhaps, with Jackson moving forward? I think Penn State has it. I expect Penn State to receive an official visit from Jackson at this point. That's probably something that will be announced a little bit sooner rather than later. Yeah, I still like Ohio State as the team to beat for Jackson, but the changes, you know, with Tony Alford leaving for mm -hmm. Michigan and, you know, Penn, and Ohio State having to go out and get a new running backs coach, you know, it creates a little bit of a window of opportunity for a program like Penn State and the others who have been really chipping away to land Bo Jackson because, you know, from the Penn State side of things, he's known Jay Wan Siders since he was an underclassman. I, you interviewed Jackson after he got his offer from Penn State and following a really good camp performance. And I believe that was his – I believe he was going into either – I think he was going into his sophomore year. Going into his so, sophomore year. Yeah, he yeah. was going into his sophomore year. So this relationship has been in place for a really, really long time. And that's something that does benefit – in this situation. Again, I do still think the Buckeyes are the ones to beat right now for Jackson, but Penn State and others, they're right there making that push. It's a big chance right now for these schools to move up the list for Jackson. And his his visit to Penn State last month for spring ball went really, really well. He really, really liked the new offense, what Andy Kolonicki has going on. So keep an eye on Penn State here, man. I think they've definitely got the staying power, and I think you know, once that official visit gets announced and locked in and finalized, no, I, I think when he gets to town, Steph's going to have a good chance with him. Tyler's also been working uh, the intel angle on Penn State basketball transfer portal action. He had a story up uh, about the first edition out of the transfer portal. And this is a man who knows his Big East basketball pretty well. I got to tell you, this Tyler Calvaruso. So he knows a little bit about Xavier big man uh, Kashi Enze. And I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly based on the pronunciation guide that uh, GoPSU put out there. But he has already been announced as uh, you know, uh, on board with this group, uh, going to be part of that 2024-2025 roster for Penn State. Uh, what kind of insight can you provide our listeners on what they're adding here? Obviously a guy who has got a lot of room to grow on the court. Physical presence down low. That's the first thing that jumps out with NZ. He Penn State, when they announced him officially yesterday, 6'8", 280. And I saw him in person during his freshman season at Xavier. And I can tell you he is legitimately six foot eight and probably 280. He is a really, really strong kid. And, you know, that 280, it, it's not bad weight. He, he is built like an ox in the paint. He's tough to move around. You know, he's interesting because not only – the big thing here is that he has multiple years of eligibility remaining. He has three years of eligibility remaining. So that gives Penn State another young big to pair with Miles Goodwin in the top 100 incoming freshman. So Brent Scott, he's going to have two really good bigs that he's going to have the opportunity to develop here moving forward. With Enze, you know, he wasn't that much of an impact player for Xavier in the first half of the season, in the first half of Big East play. But as conference play went on and he got the chance to see more minutes because, you know, Xavier was banged up throughout the year, he got the chance to see the floor more and he had some pretty impactful performances for the Musketeers. And I checked in with a Big East assistant who, you know, was definitely well more familiar with his game than I am. And the, the sentiment was as the year went on, as he got more minutes, some of the rawness that followed him to Xavier as he was still, you know, coming along in his development, you could see gradually kind of wear off. He became more refined as the year went on. So I'd say that's a plus for Penn State. Now, the search for bigs who can make an impact in 24-25 is going to continue because Enze still does have some developing to do. But I think this was a really strong start for Penn State in the portal. I really, really like the upside here. I think this was a good play by the Nittany Lions to get him on board. We had Daniel Gallon and Mark Brennan on the podcast, I believe last week, maybe the week before, just kind of forecasting what, what things look like for Penn State from a roster building perspective based on some of the early departures in the transfer portal, based on obvious needs. And they they both pointed to center. I mean, it was it was no no way around it. And uh, Favor Ire ha has entered the transfer portal after one year with the program after transferring in from Miami last year. Demetrius Lilly entered the transfer portal. He's going to be playing ball at LaSalle moving forward. Uh, so we'll see how, how they feel this. And I don't think they're done yet by any means at that position. But overall now, still waiting on a big answer regarding the roster. Tyler from Ace Baldwin, we know Puff Johnson's going to stick around, but when you kind of look ahead here a little bit, I know you had a, a, a story up on the site for our VIP subscribers about kind of what's next after adding the Xavier big man. What are you keeping tabs on with Penn State basketball in the transfer portal on their own roster and then externally? 
He's not on the portal, but like you said, definitely Ace Baldwin. That's the biggest storyline surrounding this Penn State roster for 24-25 right now. Yeah, and it's a fluid situation, and that's going to continue just given the nature of the portal and everything like that. But we continue to hear some good things about what you know Baldwin's chances of being back with the program next year. You know, we're going to continue to keep the ear to the ground and see what comes of that. But as of right now, you know, we, we've heard some positives in that regard. But the needs have remained consistent, you know, heading into next season. Penn State staff would like to add a shooter. They'd like to add a big who can really stretch the floor and open things up for them offensively. Again, Enze was a good start, you know, filling that physical big body need at center. And now it's on to addressing the shooters and, you know, a, a potential stretch big. Three scholarships for Penn State to work with here moving forward. So uh, there is definitely still the opportunity for Mike Rhodes and his staff to go out and improve this roster for year two. Tyler Cabruso does a lot for us at Lions247.com, including covering Penn State basketball and the transfer portal. Some of their picks up. We're a couple weeks away from diving headfirst back into the football transfer portal as well, my oh, friend. Yeah. But in the meantime, I know there's a lot brewing on the recruiting trail between now and the blue-white game next Saturday. We'll get you back on again soon here with the second episode. We'll break down what happened with Matt Zollers, what it means for Penn State, and we'll start to take a look toward that blue-white game and some of the confirmed visitors and, and, and what's working off the field next Saturday for the Nittany Lions. Tyler, always appreciate the perspective here on the show. Thanks for having me back, man. Good stuff from Tyler. Good stuff before him from Daniel Gallen. We, again, had a lot of opportunity yesterday on the Penn State practice field, not just to see some practice, but to hear from transfer players, to hear from a new coordinator. And a lot of that coverage is already up at lines247.com. Videos, photo gallery, VIP practice report, and commentary from conversations with Julian Fleming, Nolan Rucci, Jalen Kimber, new guys here on campus that we're starting to really get to know more about and look like they're going to be playing significant roles for Penn State in 2024. For now, we're stepping aside. We will be back, as promised, with another episode later this week. Not only will we get into uh, the latest on recruiting and Zollers, as I said, but we're going to have a special guest on, a schedule to do that. I think you all will enjoy that conversation. So stay, stay put for the next Lions 24-7 podcast coming to YouTube and wherever you find your podcast. In the meantime, we're over at lines247.com getting work done, getting stories up, getting more videos up. So go check out our content over there. Thanks as always for tuning in. I'm Tyler Donahue, and this has been the Lions 24-7 Podcast.